It is my pleasure to, to bring up Calvin Sims from the Ford Foundation to introduce the documentary we're about to screen. Calvin's got a long history of independent documentary, both here and abroad with journalism, ethics, and with new media. Uh, Ford Foundation has been a supporter of the ITVS, International Media Development Fund, which helped fund this film that we're going to see, Waltz with Bashir. So we are really delighted to have uh, Calvin here to introduce um, it. I um, am very pleased to uh, present this film. Um, some of you have may, maybe have heard about uh, Waltz with Bashir. It's already won the best film uh, for foreign, best foreign film at the Golden Globes, and it was a Critics' Choice Awards, and it has been nominated for an Academy Award. And so Ford is very pleased to be joining with Hewlett and MacArthur in supporting the ITVS's International Media Development Fund, which made this film possible. And um, it's through funds like this that Ford actually gets to put its imprint along with other foundations um, in this sort of international uh, global media space. Um, Ford last year was a sponsor along with some other foundations with Taxi to the Dark Side, which also won the Academy Award. We have a long history of working in the international space. Um, in my portfolio at Ford, where I'm a program officer, we fund a variety of international uh, media projects um, from NPR to the News Hour to fellowships for journalists to make foreign trips, um, the Council on Foreign Relations, and a variety of other efforts. Now, when it comes to Waltz, um, the first thing you're going to notice about this film is that it's animated, and that may come as a surprise to you because it is a documentary and not perhaps what you would think of the documentary being, especially about the 1982 massacre of these 3,000 Palestinians in Lebanon. Um, but this story circles in on a single night in September when the Christian uh, militia members went into a refugee camp in the heart of Beirut while the Israeli soldiers surrounded the area. I don't want to give too much away, but the director of this film, Ari Folman, was one of the, these stories, and you're one of those soldiers, and you're going to hear the stories, the real-life stories, in the real voices of the other soldiers who were there. Uh, what you're going to see on the screen today is not just a fascinating documentary, but it really is an example of the kind of um, entrepreneurship um, that many independent documentary filmmakers are actually employing today, bringing in new video elements that had before not uh, been used um, in documentary storytelling. So I want you to sort of sit back and enjoy a lot of what you're going to see here. You're going to get inside of the hearts and the minds in a way that normally is not captured. So please enjoy. It's a difficult, difficult film to watch. Uh, and uh, I must tell you, I had no, uh, I had no advance notice of what was, uh, what I was going to see. I hadn't read about the, hadn't read about the film, had not seen it myself. Um, and I suppose a, uh, a logical way to begin is by asking if you, if you know, and uh, please both of you explain how you relate in any fashion to this extraordinary piece of work that, you, that we've just seen. To the best of my knowledge, that's the first time that uh, the producers of a documentary have chosen to pick a subject like this and to do it in cartoon form. Uh, and uh, I have to ask, is it, was, was, was that the choice because it was felt that there was simply no other way of, of conveying everything that that, that that piece of work showed? Well, maybe I can jump in first. Um, and, let and me please uh, identify yourself yeah. and who you are and, and how you relate to this. Of course. Um, I'm Tamara Gould, and I'm the vice president of ITVS International um, and have been very involved with, with, with all of the international films that we've brought in through our International Media Development Fund. This was one of the first films that we actually funded in our first year, which was almost five years ago. And we, we got, actually we saw nothing of the film when we got the proposal. <laughs> and we were, we were intrigued, um, but we were also um, unsure of what the film was going to look like. And for us, this represented a tremendous risk um, because, again, it was animated, which we had never funded an animated, an animated film, but also because it was so clearly an artist's vision and with artist visions, you never know exactly what it's going to look like. Um, but we were we were all um, really 
compelled by, by the filmmaker, by Ari Folman's description of what it was that he wanted to do. We also thought maybe, animation... Maybe back up just for a moment and tell us what he told you when he was, when he was making the pitch. Sure. What he said was basically that he had a story that he always felt that he needed to tell, that he felt that it had to be animated because what he wanted to express was nothing that could be done in traditional documentary form with talking heads and with, you know, with lower thirds that describe the people who are talking, but that he really wanted to go deep into the unconscious and actually look at memory and film and psychotherapy and how all of these things would connect to truly look at, at war in a way that you're not going to see in any other way. And because we're a documentary fund, we're, we're really interested in supporting artists and also supporting alternatives to what people are looking at in terms of conventional documentary. And so we felt that this story with this particular maker had the potential to have a tremendous impact. Um, and I think, you know, we heard earlier today from Fukara that, what is it, that words have wings and actions have impact. I think what, what this shows is that films have power. They have tremendous power to transform experience and to look at something that you can't look at on the news or you can't look at it the way that Hollywood would depict this war, which is, you know, I don't know, Saving Private Ryan. I don't know what the comparable is, but this is a unique artist's lens to look at truth and get at experience in a way that you just can't get it in another form. And we were compelled. This film took four years to make. There were 11 animators. It took about two, close to $2 million dollars. Um, for this film, not uh, not all our investment by any stretch. We were we were a small percentage of that. Uh, but this film, despite how hard it is to watch this film, it's actually had remarkable success for a documentary. Not monetarily, really. Although Sony Pictures Classics picked this up to be distributed theatrically, um, and it will air on Sundance uh, next year. And so I think that, you know, people are responding to this film, obviously because of what's happening in the world and because the sort of temporal displacement of a war story that goes back to 1982, but in a way could be told today, where you have an Israeli soldier who's sort of looking at the, you know, what he says is like the idiocy of soldiers and kind of these young guys and what they're, what they're involved with. It has so much resonance today, and it's able to express the emotions that people are seeing when they're seeing the images come out of Gaza today, of course. Um, and so we're really extraordinarily proud of our involvement with this film, but I think it's really paradigmatic of the kinds of films that we're seeking through our fund, which are films that are authentic, which have credible voices, and which are made by artists. And I think that's, you know, th that's kind of the magical uh, combination that, that, that we need and that we're looking for, and that's tr truly missing. I mean, it's not, it's not, you know, when you're looking at the marketplace and when people are trying to sell you ideas and sell you something, or you're looking at the it's sort of the official government voice. You know, you can't quite picture a film like this coming out of the USG. Um, I think it really clearly illuminates that third way, which is that you need context and you need a vision. And, and with that, people are really able to connect to a story. Yvette, we've, we've been gathered here today to talk about public diplomacy. Uh, and I don't know whether this is an appropriate question to put to you, but uh, first of all, has this film been seen in Lebanon or anywhere in the Arab world? This particular film? Yes. I, I actually don't know. Um, it will be. This film was just released theatrically, um, actually in December. It just came to D.C. this week. Um, but it will be distributed globally, um, so, and it will be seen in that part of the world. I, I, I guess I'd better stick with you while we're, talking, film, at, sure. while we're talking about the film specifically. On the one hand, um, I find it to be a, uh, an extraordinary act of national confidence for mm -hmm. an Israeli team to put this kind of a film together. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, I cannot imagine, if I were Lebanese, mm -hmm. what the experience would be like to watch this film in all its subtlety, in all its horror, and to come out of it and say, well, I certainly respect the Israelis for putting that film on. I, I, I don't know what my reaction would be. They must have talked about that. That must have been one of their concerns before they made the film. I think that um, 
you know, the importance, and I know there's many groups here who are doing this, and also Yvette's group, of looking at film as a tool of conflict resolution. I think that the making of the film itself was a tremendous um, piece of trying to create bridges. You have soldiers who are looking at themselves not in a flattering light. He goes back to interview all of his, all of his compatriots, and they're not proud of what they've done, and they don't, and they look at the, sort of what's happened to their own lives because of their involvement. So I think there's, if not an apology, a real reckoning that will come through to audiences who are, who, you know, who are, who are not Israeli. What's also interesting is that, I mean, you look at the major funders of the film, and, and the Israeli, Israeli um, film financing is, accounts for the majority of the film. So they were really behind the story, even though it's, it doesn't portray Israel in a, in a flattering light. Yvette. Yeah, and actually, I would say, and my name is and Yvette yes, Alringtheim, and I work for Witness. And Witness is an, is an NGO that addresses human rights abuses, particularly through the use of video. Because we really believe that you can use video and online technologies to, to change policy practices and behavior. And what um, Witness was actually started originally because Peter Gabriel, the musician, is one of the co-founders of Witness, and he was on a human rights tour, and he started talking to people, and he, he heard their personal stories and he filmed them. And he realized that something very powerful actually happens when you put something in a video, is that if you empower people to tell their own stories, you can start using those stories as really powerful tools for justice. So what we do is we believe, and I think this film is an incredible example of something that could also really be used to change people's behaviors and, and to change policy. because. For us, just making the film itself is not enough. It's, it's really thinking who's the actual audience, who's the target audience for that film, and who are the influencers that can take a film and actually change something with it. Um, to give you one example is we, we, we work with a lot of uh, local human rights organizations together, and we have one partnership with a local Congolese organization which is called um, Ajedika, and we made a film about child soldiers. And when that film was made, we, we had child soldiers themselves tell their stories, but that film was particularly made with a specific audience in mind, and the audience was the International Criminal Court. So one of the questions that I was asked is, is why distribution always very important? And I think that what's really important is that f these kinds of films get seen by the people who actually need to see them and who can then actually make a difference. So with that film, for example, um, which has been really the product of years of lobbying and getting it in right, of, right, you know, showing it to the prosecutors for the International Criminal Court, one of the militia leaders was a guy called Thomas Lubanga was picked up and last Monday the first ever trial uh, of the International Criminal Court focused on him and uh, addressing the war crime of using children in war. So I think that's a really direct example of how video, as sometimes part of an overall campaign to address injustices, can really have a powerful impact. You, you almost need a facilitator mm -hmm. to help mm -hmm. you watch this film. I'm not sure that it's enough just to walk into a theater without any preparation, see the film, and then walk out again without an opportunity to discuss it. I mean, more than, it, you know, it's not really a date film. Yeah, I, um, I, um, I opened my uh, laptop while I was watching this film, and actually to see if there was a website and a blog, and if there was any community around it, and um, I actually have to apologize, because the lady behind me said, are you watching this film, or are you going to, <laughs> Look at your laptop. Uh, and what, I, what we really believe in is that you can kind of do both, but that context is unbelievably important. We launched a website called The Hub, which is a platform where anyone can upload um, media for that has to do with human rights violations. But the important point is take action around it. Uh, learn how other people are actually using video to address human rights abuses, create communities and, and really do something about it. Um, and so I'm actually curious, because I think in this case, uh, you know, I can really imagine that there's a need, as you said, there's a need for context. And what we try to do on our website is put links to websites where you can get more information, contextualize it in the terms of other, other videos. And, and if you think about talking about uh, dip diplomacy, I think this is an incredible act of, uh, diplomacy, because where it starts sometimes is just acknowledging that every country, and that includes the U.S., has challenges on the human rights front. So I think if the U.S. 
would have made a film like this, and it would have had been about Abu Ghraib, or you know, starting by acknowledging your own sort of challenges and sharing those stories, I think it goes a long way towards diplomacy. But I, you know, I want to just I want to respond, and I want to respond to to um, Andrew's comment earlier today about the demise of television, because one of our philosophies behind our program is that probably the most important thing is to get people to watch them. We, you know, it's, of course the context is important and a moderator is important, but mostly we want people to see them. And who, what's been, you know, essential for us is having broadcast partners. And what we've done is that of the 82 films, of which this one is an example, every film that we've funded so far has actually shown on television. And part of what we've been able to do is obviously remove some of the commercial equation by offering these films at lower prices to, to channels. But I will say that there is an appetite. You know, one you know one of the challenges was not just finding and you know selecting and getting these films made around the world, but actually getting them to American audiences. And we thought that was going to be just a daunting task. And everybody was saying there is no market in the U.S. for subtitled films, and you'll never get these on. And and sure, it hasn't been easy. But on the other hand, there has been an appetite. Um, broadcasters have taken these films. We now have 22 outlets that are showing these films, including major outlets, including PBS, HBO, Independent Film Channel, Sundance Channel, Link TV. They want these programs. Americans want these programs. And they want, they want programming that assumes that they're not stupid, to go back to Smith's point, and programs that, that challenge their intelligence and help them connect with other parts of the world. And, and that, that premise, we weren't sure that was going to be true. But in our experience in these last four years, it has borne out that you know, we, an estimated 50 million people have watched these programs in the US. And that number will only grow as the films are played again and distributed on, online as well. Let's, uh, let's bring our audience into this, because I can, I, can, I can only imagine that some of you are bursting to say something or ask something. Judith? Thank you, Judith Kipper. First, your comment that the U.S. government ought to, uh, you know, do a film in Abu Ghraib. I'm sorry, that's not the job of the U.S. government. The job of the U.S. government, which they didn't do very well and hopefully will potentially be corrected, is to be a truth teller about what government forces have done and if crimes have been committed to prosecute the crimes. If somebody else wants to make a documentary, that's the job of somebody else. It is not the job of government to tell the story of Abu Ghraib in a film. It would be an aberration of what this kind of film can do. And I would just say, you know, about it's a fantastic film. I've been looking forward to seeing it. It's extraordinary that it's animated because people can take it animated. But we shouldn't go from the specific to the generic. This was the story of a man, mm -hmm. his story and his colleague's story. And it did not embrace the stereotypes that we usually see, the brashness, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it was very tender and very, very sad. And I think that validates it in a very, very important way. Now, Ted, to you about what the Lebanese see, there isn't a single Lebanese, including ones that uh, Leon was three years old at that time, but there isn't a single Lebanese that doesn't know this story in detail. And the Lebanese, though it's always somebody else's fault in the Arab world, uh, you know, they never make I statements, mostly neither do the Israelis. The Lebanese, as they speak among themselves, Christians, Muslims, and, uh, uh, and others, will admire the Israelis for having investigated Shatil and Sabra, and all these years later, for being capable of doing this film. My, Which my is, and just to end my comment, which is why Abu Ghraib and Guantanamo are, are so horrible, because we didn't do that. My, my question, no, uh, hold on, uh, Judith, because I was going to uh, direct a question to you. <laughs> my sense was that um, in the wrong hands, that's why I was talking about a facilitator, someone who can put the film into even more context than the film puts itself. In the wrong hands, that could be an argument for even more bitter anti-Israeli feelings. I can see a, I can see a forum in which that film could be shown, and used as what more do you want? What more do you need to know? But what you have seen here, this is the Israelis trying as best they can, perhaps to put it in a pseudo psychiatric, uh, uh, you know, shell. 
but it proves what we've been saying all along. That's why I wonder how this film is going to be perceived in different places. Actually, Ted, I think uh, a film like this, first there is that danger that it'd be in the wrong hands because this was a film about bad things that the Israelis and Christians did, and there was not a Muslim context except for the victims. But I would say that a film like this seen in the Arab world uh, is, uh, of course, there's always people that will, could use it in a negative way any place in the world. But I believe that because the Israelis were trying to come to terms with it, and all you see of the Christian phalange, which was a fascist party, perfect fascist party, and I knew Bashir Jamayel quite well, uh, uh, that they are the bad guys in this film because they did the murder, they like to do the murder, and there was no context within the film of them examining what they did. And to this day, they've never examined what they did. And this is all these years later. Can I? <laughs> Can I respond really briefly? Uh, I wasn't suggesting that the US government become a filmmaker. I, I, the beauty. I think of the time we live in, and that's one of the reasons we created this website, is that you know, witness used to package up cameras and send them to people on the other side of the world to film what was going on and to help them, empower them to, to, to change the situations they were in. You know, we no longer really have to do that. Uh, you know, and Abu Ghraib is actually a really good example of that cameras are in the hands of everyone and it's precisely that <laughs> becomes a very powerful tool, tool for anybody to create justice. So, but I, in a sense of uh, public diplomacy, you know, I think it would, it would be great if the US government would indirectly you know, fund these kinds of tools and make this, this possible uh, if, you know, if the question is, should, should the US government uh, use film for diplomacy? I think film can be extremely powerful and if the, if, if the right tools get in the right hands of people that a lot of change can actually happen. Please. Thank you for that. I mean, I was three years old. Uh, Leon Shahabian, I'm here not in my capacity as a Lebanese commentator, which I'm not. I make similar movies that are shown on Sundance through La Elena and I believe my colleague earlier spoke about our work, so I won't. I'll just say that um, Persepolis, which is a movie a lot of you are familiar with, was not seen in Lebanon. Hezbollah is close to Iran. Iran did not like how it was portrayed in this movie. The movie was not shown. Sure. As uh, the same case was with uh, Schindler's List. So Arab countries, when it comes to film versus pan-Arab free-to-air satellite television, are able to exercise censorship. But this is a, this is a huge issue, um, you know. But what's interesting, I mean, and, and I think looking at looking at censorship and where films can't be seen is is of course a, a large issue we all have to deal with. One of the things that we've been interested in is where they, you know, who they can be seen by and who's interested in finding them. We've found some unusual partners, and I know, Yvette, you've had some interesting partners, too. Um, one of them was the U.S. Naval Postgraduate School, who held a three-day Windows on the World film symposium where they screened almost all of the films that we've funded so far for all of their um, soldiers in training to basically get a better window of, of the countries that they're going to be engaged with in different ways. And so they saw films not about war, but films, for example, like ABC Columbia, about a small school in Columbia where students are basically, you know, sixth graders are choosing in a school play whether they're going to be part of the paramilitary or they're going to be cocaine growers or, you know, and this is sort of the environment in which these kids are, are, are growing up. And so, for example, they see films like that as an, to get a better understanding of the war on drugs and what they're going to be doing in Columbia. And, and they have 82 of those kinds of films that are part of cultural awareness. Um, which I think you know has an impact on people that you're not sure are seeing the films. I mean, I think Ted, to your point about how how much we can frame this and how much we can sort of contextualize the documentaries, you know, it's our hope in the documentaries that we're funding that they themselves are contextualizing the story certainly more than than is happening in the short news that is now being allotted, especially to foreign affairs that we've, we've also talked about. I mean, in my mind, it's no accident really that in the last five years, as we've seen the decline in confidence and trust in the in the news, we've seen the year of the documentary now five years in a row 
because people are looking for they're looking for context and they're looking for something that looks like truth and that's not coming from the news and part of why it's not coming from the news is because even the news now feels like it's trying to convince you of a point of view and when you watch Fox you know you're getting different news than when you watch MSNBC and people are so much savvier in terms of oh the news is not just the news the news is somebody's news whereas at least with documentaries a they give you a longer format so you can spend some time with the subject which is something people still actually want even though everybody thinks the web means that everybody wants short stories the truth is that people are watching longer and longer pieces even on the web um, and the truth about television is that people are still watching four hours a day on average of television. So to, to this idea that television is going somewhere, it's not. People are sitting, they're spending time, and they want things that provide context. I have to wonder how an American audience today, not as sophisticated an audience as this one, certainly, but how an American audience today would view a similar film about Mi Lai, <laughs> where... I don't even remember the number anymore. Jay, what was it? A couple of hundred, three hundred villagers were were killed by American troops, uh, massacred, and the end result was that one American, Lieutenant William Calley, was put on trial, uh, got a few years, and then was released. I think after two or three years. Uh, even today, I think it would be shattering. But I worry about whether most of the viewers would even have a context for it. I, I'm sure it's not taught in our schools. I, I do think context is actually really quite important. I, you know, you're right, if it's a longer film, you know, sometimes there's more explanation, but one of the things we've learned with our website is that, you know, there's short pieces of video and that people really do care about, you know, what happened. Like, if you go onto YouTube and you see a video of, for example, the Oscar Grant killing the man who was killed in the BART station in San Francisco, um, without really understanding what has happened, a lot of questions come into your mind, like what happened, you know, it's, you know what's, what's the situation here? And one thing we try to do with our website is, is provide links to organizations, also because people like to take action. So, for example, we put the we have the video of Oscar Grant, but then it will say if you're interested in actually doing something about it, you know, making sure that justice actually really happens, go to the following organizations that are specifically sort of giving you more information about it and do things. So I, I, I think context is really, is actually quite important. And I think the same way that there's a hunger for these kinds of, I, I totally agree, the audience is there, is that beyond watching something, people really would like to know how they can create change, and that's not just a whole new YouTube generation. I think it's, it's everywhere. We've got time for two more quick questions. Uh, we'll take the lady and then the gentleman in the back. Um, well, this, this is not so much a question. My name is Susan Cohen. I'm with the State Department. And I merely wanted to say that um, we still send feature films overseas for U.S. embassies to use in contextual situations. They facilitate discussion. But more important, um, to the point of this discussion, we do tons of documentary programs. We are uh, about to launch a 30 documentary, a program involving 30 documentaries that will go to at least 50 different US posts around the world with filmmakers, with film specialists, with representatives from University Film and Video Association, International Documentary Association. They will be contextualized. There are study guides. There will be websites. There will be discussion. So I just wanted to let everybody know, and I have to defend my own office, that these things are, in fact, happening. And we even brought, we brought foreign uh, uh, emerging documentary filmmakers to the United States for training at the GW Documentary Center. These are people from countries without perhaps a long tradition of, doc of documentary filmmaking, which does involve a good degree of self-criticism. And um, we even, once upon a time, sent the fog of war to the Middle East, uh, where it was well received, not because so much people really cared about the criticism of us inherent in, not of us, but of uh, former US policy inherent in the fog of war, uh, speaking of Vietnam, but it, it showed the U.S. warts and all. I mean, that's, you know, the validity of what you do is when you can show everything. Uh, so I just have to 
speak out for what we do do and we do facilitate and we do contextualize. Good. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mark Hanna, I a uh, graduate student at Columbia University, also contribute to a blog on new media at pbs.org. Um, thank you very much for the film. I thought it was extremely cathartic. Um, my question is, I, I don't agree that, you know, it's just our role to tell the truth about, you know, uh, America. I think in, uh, when you talk about telling America's story, there's an element in any type of storytelling of um, a narrative and, and selective being selective about what truths you tell and, and what things you, you necessarily leave out. So I do, I do think, you know, these types of films being underwritten in some fashion by, uh, by whether it's a State Department or some, some part of the government would be extremely useful. My question is, do you think that that might somehow hamper the, the artists, the artistry of the film or uh, put some constraints on what point of view they're at that point once they accept that government money? Uh, able to show. And then the second part of the question is, with the emergence of new media in certain uh, countries, the problem about censorship and exhibition of some of these films, do you think that might be overcome by streaming them online? And, and obviously internet penetration isn't as, uh, as enormous as it could be, but uh, do you think there are workarounds for, for that sort of censorship? Thank you. Yvette, do you want to begin? Uh, as, a, as an organization that does not accept government funding, uh, I'm going to start with your second part of the question. Uh, you know, I think that the internet, in that sense, is an extremely powerful tool. If you saw what happened with, uh, you know, police brutality against bloggers in Egypt, where um, a, a piece of mobile video actually documenting that surfaced, you know, the first thing that happened is somebody put it on YouTube, and then bloggers started talking about it. And at that point, it was out of the hands of the censors, right? Uh, and I think, so in that sense, I think that, um, you know, that the, the web will really help that uh, sort of sort of fight censorship. And I forget who said it, but there were some very specific, uh, I think um, Howcast created some very specific, you know, sort of videos to show people how to get around that. But, um, you know, no censor is going to be able to keep up with what's happening with uh, having mobile phones in everybody's hands and, and outlets for people to get them out and create community around them, I think. I hope. Um, let me let me ans let me take on the first part of your question about the government funding. I think there's a very happy role um, for a combination of public-private financing and partnerships in this arena. I think our program has has really been a, a very successful example of that. On the private philanthropic side, we've been supporting the international films that we've been bringing into the U.S. And then with actually with with State Department money, I'm working with Susan and, and her team at ECA. We've actually taken some of our American films that we're funding. Um, through funding from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and packaging them into a series of American documentaries about stories that have been airing on PBS and distributing those to countries sort of outside of major markets, countries like Peru and Bahrain, Indonesia, um, and really trying to connect people with American stories. And what we found is that initially there was some suspicion on the part of our filmmakers, like what does this mean? Are we, you know, is this, you know, but but when we, we could say, look, this isn't about changing your content. This is, a, you know, we are a third party independent agency who's doing this work. Um, then they were happy that their films were being distributed. I think had that funding come from the Department of Defense, it wouldn't have been so so clear. It depends on where, the, where in the US government and to what purpose. But I think that as long as the, the film agency that's actually doing the work has a third party um, credibility, then I think the program has credibility. And I think, in fact, the, the public side of funding is really important. I mean, look, Corporation for Public Broadcasting is public funding, and that's what supports the content that goes onto PBS. I mean, that's a, it's a fundamental part of any healthy society. It's just a question of how it's, where the levers of, of editorial control are being pulled. And that'll be the last word. Tamara, Correct. Yvette, thank, thank you, you very you. much. And, uh, <laughs> thanks all of you. Well, um, it has been a rich and full day, a very important day, uh, which yielded lots of good discussion as well as very good ideas. Uh, strong calls for more credible citizen voices and debate around our investment in public broadcasting and filmmaking. Um, there were many more good recommendations, and as I look back on the day, I'm reminded that many of the great moments of public diplomacy in the past have really come when the great minds of media 
and the great minds of diplomacy come together and work together as we saw today. And Ted, um, you were part of some of those great moments in your work on South Africa, your work on Iran, on China, elsewhere. So we are extremely grateful that you helped us today to advance this discussion um, of this really very complex issue. So thank you very, very much. And of course, a huge thanks to our many panelists who came from far and wide to share their insights with us for the day. Um, I think today's session really brought home uh, just how profoundly the flow of information and ideas has continued to transform our world and how important it is that that flow be two-way between the United States and the world in the 21st century. We are going to be synthesizing this conversation, the many recommendations that we heard. Um, we will be distributing that, publishing it, as well as the links, links to some of the material that you've heard referred to here. Um, Lastly, I want to thank you all for being just such a terrific audience. It has been a, a long, long day. There's an old baseball story about the pitcher who's on the mound, and he's, he's getting knocked out of the box. Somebody's hitting long fly balls to the left field, long fly balls to the right field. And the coach comes in, and he says to this pitcher on the mound, he says, um, time to come out. And the pitcher says, no, 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 I'm, I'm fine, I'm fine. And the coach says, no, 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 it's time to come out. And he says, no, coach, really, honestly, I'm not tired. And the coach says, yeah, but the outfielders are. <laughs> and you have been great outfielders catching everything we've been throwing at you all day. So thank you very, very much. And thank you to all those staff folks who helped to make this day a wonderful day as well. So on behalf of the United States Institute of Peace and our partners, ITVS, let me declare this meeting officially adjourned. And thank you again.